Hello and welcome to the Atoll, your home for Waterworld fandom. In today's deep dive video, we will be exploring everything we know about the tomato plant in Waterworld. And if you think I'm not able to create an entire video on this topic, then I implore you to stick around to the end because we have some truly mind-blowing surprises to share. The first time we see the tomato plant in the extended cut of the film is in the shot of the tavern slash trading post on the atoll, and in the background of a couple other shots leading up to the first time that the Mariner and Helen meet. In the novelization, this introductory tavern slash trading post scene is even a little bit longer, with Helen speaking to two scruffy traders. One trader asks what's so great about dirt that it's overvalued and you can't eat it, to which Helen replies by saying that you can eat the fruits and vegetables that grow from it. The trader retorts saying that you can't grow much and points to the scrawny tomato plant on the shelves behind her. Helen explains that it is the hope that dirt carries that quote, it reminds us of in some deep secret place born in us. In the theatrical cut, the first time we really see the tomato plant is not until the mariner actually makes his way to the tavern slash trading post. After conversing with Helen, including asking her if she has any seeds for sale, and then being chatted up by the Nord, the mariner asks if the greenery at the end of the bar is a tomato plant. Helen tells him that he has a keen eye, to which the mariner replies that he has seen one in a picture, most likely alluding to an image in one of his beloved National Geographic magazines. The mariner spends half his chits on the plant and then purchases the shelves of the store as well. In the next shot, we see the mariner making his way back to the trimaran with the tomato plant safely under his arm. The mariner is halted by the atoll elders that wish him to impart his quote seed before leaving. When he refuses and begins to load the trimaran with his supplies, the atoll's gateman steps in and this eventually leads to a fight and the mariner's capture. During all of this, we actually lose track of the location of the tomato plant in the film. However, the novelization tells us that when the Gatesman grapples him, he drops the tomato plant, but thankfully without, quote, much dirt spillage or the pot breaking. Also, in the novelization, after the Mariner is captured, we are told that the Atoll Enforcer, quote, took charge of the Mariner's property, the netting bag of shells, and the potted tomato plant. The tomato plant doesn't actually pop back up until nearly 28 minutes later in the film, towards the end of the atoll battle as the mariner is guiding the trimaran through the now open gates, he spots the tomato plant floating among the debris of the skirmish. The mariner retrieves it and without hesitation tosses it below deck. This moment always reminded me a little of how Indiana Jones recovers his iconic hat whenever they become separated. You will also notice that the tomato plant looks a little different here, clearly being an artificial plant, obviously to hold up to the more rigorous conditions of this in the following scenes. You can actually see in the scenes using the real plant that it looks quite pitiful, probably due to the roughness served up by the production of the film. The next time we see the tomato plant is in a scene only present in the extended cuts of Waterworld. Sometime after the atoll battle, the mariner has partially repaired the water purifier and loads it up with not only his urine, but also that of Helen's and Enola's. After sending the liquid through the apparatus, he takes a portion for himself and then pours out some for his dear tomato plant and gives the rest to Enola. The tomato plant in this scene seems to be hanging freely from the mast days of the trimaran. This scene in the novelization has the mariner spitting the hydro into the pot instead, to which Helen protests by saying, quote, Part of that came from me, you know. In the next scene, the mariner is relaxing and steering the trimaran from the starboard outrigger. While being pestered by Enola, the mariner casually picks and eats the leaves from the plant like a bag of potato chips. After he tosses Enola overboard, he sits back down to his plant, but is slapped by Helen, then decides he's going to drop sail and come about to retrieve Enola. The next time we see the tomato plant, it's harvest time. This scene is only present in the extended cuts of the film. It begins with a rack focus from Helen and Enola to the fully ripe tomato. The mariner tests it tenderly with his fingertips before plucking the fruit from the tree. The mariner then posts up on the starboard stern crossbar and unsheaths his boot knife. 
Taking the delicate produce between his fingers, he slices the morsel and devours one half. He then slices the other half again as Helen and Enola watch fervently from the forward deck and begin crawling towards him. He eats another quarter of the tomato and then the last quarter till only the juice of the tomato remains on the hull of the boat. Helen and Enola, with starvation in their eyes, spring upon the small amount of moisture, but the mariner intercepts them, taking the last dredges for himself. The mariner then takes up his telescope and spots a fellow drifter on the horizon. This is where the scene begins in the theatrical cut of Waterworld, and given the drama and buildup of the tomato eating scene, this helps to give context to why Helen shouts the line, maybe he has some food, which can feel a bit out of place if you've only ever viewed the theatrical cut. In the novelization, this scene plays out much quicker without Helen and Enola watching and the Mariner using a wooden block to do the cutting on. And I do find it somewhat surprising that the Mariner does not collect the tomato seeds for replanting since, you will remember, seeds were something that he was looking for back on the atoll in the tavern slash trading post. After the mariner has joined with the drifter's boat to trade, the drifter acknowledges the tomato plant as a potential trade item, calling it a quote, we orchard. And this is actually the last time we see the tomato plant in all versions of the film, and just look at how pathetic this poor plant is, completely stripped of all of its leaves. I guess we're to believe that the mariner truly ingested the entire plant, and this is for sure a sad shot for us to leave the tragic tomato plant upon. But actually, in the novelization, we're given a little additional lore, with the Mariner trading two rearview mirrors, which can actually be seen in the film, and the tomato plant for a coil of rope from the drifter. This occurs just before the deplorable scene where the Mariner trades Helen's body for a jar of paper. But before we move on to our discussion of where the tomato plant finds itself in the greater Waterworld lore, I just wanted to run down and shout out the other vegetation that we see in the film and novelization. Of course, there is also the lime tree, which we can see in the very first scene of the film. After the mariner has taken a drink from his recycling machine, he gargles the last bit of water and spits it out into the pot of the dwarfed lime tree. A lime tree would obviously be very valuable in Waterworld given that citrus fruits are an excellent way to fight off scurvy, which often inflicts sailors at sea that have a severe lack of vitamin C in their diet. While the mariner is diving, the trimaran is boarded by a stranger and the limes from the tree are stolen. After the mariner resurfaces, he finds a drifter has appeared in the waters near the trimaran. After some discussion, the mariner and the drifter realize that two smoker jet skis are about to ambush them. As the drifter is making his getaway, he reveals that he has stolen the mariner's precious limes. In the novelization, the limes fall out of the drifter's shirt accidentally. The Mariner springs into action, transforming the Trimaran from trolling mode to sailing mode and proceeds to run down the thieving drifter. And in fact, this epic shot is the last time we see the lime tree in the film. However, the novelization reveals in the scene in which the Mariner sits in the cage above the Organo Barge that he watches looting Atoller steal the lime plant from the Trimaran. And speaking of the Organo Barge, this is another place where we see more attempts at growing vegetation on Waterworld and is likely where the tomato plant first sprouted from. A funeral is taking place when we first see the Organo Barge as the Mariner makes his way into the Atoll Lagoon. All the organic material is recycled here and the novelization even adds the fact that outhouses also dot the multi-tiered Organo Barge. As the funeral progresses, the elders recite a prayer that makes mention of berries, vines, trees, and brine. Also, in the novelization, the elders ceremoniously spread pure dirt over the fresh grave. Looming over this section of the atoll is a giant and weathered fruit tree that the novelization describes as being mournful. The tree itself was actually created from wood, steel, and foam. Under the tree are smaller crops as well as the gravestones of the dead. In the extended cuts of the film during the Atoll Town meeting, Helen tells us that the gardens are dying much like the rest of their society. The novelization also reveals to us that Gregor has fruit grafting experiments that he is conducting in his laboratory. 
However, the giant old growth tree meets a bitter end after the Atoll battle when smokers decide to take chainsaws to its branches. In the novelization, it also catches on fire. And check out the fruit that this tree is bearing, these large oblong gourds. What do you guys suppose this fruit is meant to be? Perhaps the fruit from the atoll tree is also a mutation like the mariner or the whale fin. In the Making of Waterworld book, it suggests that it is a dying lemon tree, representing, quote, the tree of life. Also, after the Atoll battle, we are told by the Smoker Ledger that the Atoll had 44 old growth grapevines and 10 assorted fruit trees. Some other vegetation that we see in the film are these long dead trees that the Mariner and Helen pass by as they explore the underwater ski area towards the end of the film. Vegetation can also be seen among the pages of the National Geographics that the Mariner owns and in the drawings that Enola makes, which of course are depictions of her deep memories of dry land which she originally came from. And this leads us to the great abundance of vegetation at the end of the film when our companions finally arrive at dry land. To quote the novelization, trees lined the beach, so many trees, so many kinds of trees, more trees than any picture in any magazine or book he'd ever seen. And, of course, as the mariner is parting from dry land, we can see that he has loaded up his new catamaran with a few potted plants for his next journey. At this point, I would like to go back to our discussion of the tomato plant specifically and see if we can find its presence anywhere else within the expanded lore of Waterworld. So let's begin with the original Waterworld script penned by Peter Rader, which actually makes no mention of the tomato plant but does make reference to some olive trees growing on the deck of the USS Bridgestone, the large ship that the companions find towards the end of the script. The tomato plant can also be found among the Waterworld Fleer Ultra trading cards on cards number 18, Shopping Spree, number 20, Questions and Answers, and number 21, Proposition. And looking at the Waterworld Pogs, you can actually spot the tomato eating scene on Pog number 6. Turning to the video games of Waterworld, from what I can tell, the tomato plant only seems to pop up in one title, that being the Quest for Dryland PC game. In the live action cutscenes, we can see that the Atoll Elder, played by Zakes Moquet, tends to a tomato plant which sits in the sunny window of his personal quarters. The tomato plant actually pops up a ton of times throughout the game's cutscenes, which I really enjoy. And since the live action cutscenes reuse props from the film, I think it's almost certain that this is the same tomato plant prop that we saw in the actual film. Looking at the comics, Waterworld, The Children of the Leviathan, we have what I believe is a clear callback to the Mariner's tomato plant. In comic number one, as the rebel subsect of the Foundation, a society of underwater dwellers, emerges from the submersible for the first time on the surface of Waterworld, they are immediately attacked by the Leviathan's minions, a group of savage pirates that rule the open oceans of Waterworld. As they cut down the naive detracting Foundationers, we can actually spot a tomato plant here on the side of the surface submarine, a totally amazing and subtle callback to the film. And wouldn't you know it, even Waterworld, a live sea war spectacular, has a tomato plant. A few years ago when I attended the live stunt show in Hollywood, California, I snapped this picture of the potted tomato plant that was hanging around the show's arena. While actual props from the film can be found in the show's stadium, I don't believe this is the tomato plant used in the film, but it is undoubtedly very close in appearance and a clear reference to the prop from the movie. And I'm not sure if the stunt shows in Japan, Singapore, or China have a similar piece of set dressing, so let me know in the comments if you've spotted our friend the tomato plant at these other locations. And finally, let me reveal to you what is almost certainly the most rare and unusual of all my Waterworld collectibles, the Waterworld Miniature Tomato Plant. That's right, this is an officially branded Waterworld tomato seed planter that, from what I can tell, was given to some video rental stores as promotional swag to celebrate the video release of Waterworld in 1996, and yeah, can you believe something like this even exists? 
The tiny terracotta pot is surrounded by cardboard packaging with the map to dry land as setting sun motif on the top, and I really love how the shape of the sun matches the shape of the pot. On one side of the packaging, we have the announcement of Waterworld's quote, street date, January 23rd, 1996, which is when the film became available on home video. Under that is the MCA Universal Home Video logo. On the other side of the packaging are the words Waterworld Miniature Tomato Plant, and under that we are given some directions on how to start growing our own wee orchard. And on the bottom is a list of the contents, which include a 50 milligram packet of Rutger tomato seeds, a 33.6 gram terracotta plant, and a 4.45 gram easy soil water. And while I actually debated trying to grow the tomato plant from this extraordinarily obscure and hard to obtain Waterworld collectible, after some research I determined that it was almost implausible to think that 25 plus year old tomato seeds would actually germinate, with tomato seeds only lasting about 5 years when stored in proper conditions. So I'm going to keep this one in mint condition, as the crowning jewel of my Waterworld collection. And there you have it, that is everything we know about the tomato plant in Waterworld. I actually been wanting to do this video for some time, but I've been waiting to find my own Waterworld miniature tomato plant which I knew existed but took three years to finally surface on eBay. So if you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a comment or a thumbs up before you go. That kind of stuff really helps with the channel. And if you haven't already, subscribe! We have a great backlog of videos and playlists for you to check out and many more planned for the future. Also, follow the A to on Instagram for even more Waterworld content or to reach out to me personally. Link in the description below. But with that, thanks, as always, for joining me at the Atoll.